Amen. Well, good morning, LCM. Today's date is January the 12th, 2020. And the title of our sermon today is Elevating Your Zeal. Oh, this is something that we need, church. Because if we're going to elevate our priesthood, we need to elevate our zeal for the Lord. Last Wednesday night, was a message that pierced, severed, and circumcised our hearts. And it was done by the one and only Pastor Wade, the homiletic blade. Did he bring it on Wednesday? In that message, bit and bridle priest, both Pastor Wade and myself are calling this body of believers to elevate our priesthood by identifying areas of our lives where we like Balaam, seek to renegotiate. Say renegotiate. Renegotiate. Renegotiate what the Lord has clearly told us to do, but the soils of our heart reveal that we really don't want to do it. Did you guys learn anything on Wednesday about Balaam? Uh, I know that I got a tremendous revelation. Uh, The way that Pastor Wade brought that message, it, it put Balaam in a light that I've a more complete light than I've ever seen before. And it really spoke to me because Balaam was in the habit of renegotiating the things that God said. You know, this admittedly is a very uncommon problem among those who express a desire to follow the Lord, right? No, 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 no. Not uncommon at all. He has no solidarity of conviction. We talked about that with Balaam. His convictions all over the place. He is a for-profit prophet. He desires to gain something for doing something for the Lord. Oh, Nick, that's not a 501c3. That's a 501c me. (laughs) He is so adept at getting the applause of men. This is building on that same concept. It's that selfishly ambitious concept that Balaam had. What's in it for me? What can I gain from this? Uh, How can I get people to see me and to reward me for what I have done? He does what he wants and thinks that he is following God the whole time. You see, all of the predecessors to this one leads to this one. Deception. And you think that you're actually doing something for God when you're doing something for yourself. You see, partial obedience produces a partial priesthood, not a perpetual priesthood. And that's what we're going after this year. We're going after that perpetual priesthood. I'm not satisfied with one, two, three, even four generations. And I know that you aren't either. We will be satisfied when we lay a foundation for a perpetual priesthood and we see it come about. You see, praise God that we're in the midst of a campaign to elevate our priesthood right now. Praise God that we're right here because our commander, the Lord God Almighty is his name, the Lord of hosts and of the heavenly armies. He gave us a charge on New Year's Eve. He did. Centered around Numbers 25. We've been cultivating our hearts for the past several weeks from this passage. So let's go there together. Numbers 25 is where we're going to start this morning. And we're going to begin to receive our marching orders in order to elevate our priesthood from partial to perpetual. You guys there in Numbers 25? Let's start in verse 6. Then an Israelite man brought to his family a Midianite woman right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, say saw, Saw. he left the assembly, say left, took a spear in his hand, say spear, Spear. and followed the Israelite into the tent, say followed. Followed. Next, he drove the spear through both of them, say drove. Drove. Through the Israelite and into the woman's body, then the plague against the Israelites was stopped. 
We're going to break down this passage because it has set the precedent for us of how to establish a perpetual priesthood. When you guys heard some of the previous messages about Phinehas, did that inspire you? Did it also convict you? It should be doing both. So we're going to take this apart and see exactly how did Phinehas become Phinehas. And some of the elements that we must imitate in order to possess the same perpetual priesthood that he did. The first thing that we see is that in verse 7, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this. What was everybody else doing? They were weeping. How easy is it to see when you're weeping? You got some blurry vision, right? Especially if it's that kind where it's crocodile tears and you have a, a, a flow of lava coming out of your nose. I mean, it's just ugly crying. Ugly. You can't see too well. Your vision is blurred. But Phinehas looked up and he saw what was going on. See, this is the awakening process. The awakening of the zeal of the Lord. When we wipe the tears away from our eyes and begin to see what God sees. When we begin to focus on what God is focused on. We begin to experience a revival. An opening of vision, discernment, and understanding to what's going on around us. We're not just falling in line with the conformity of everybody else's feelings and comfort. But we begin to find distinction. Because our eyes are open to see the agreement between the Word and the Spirit. Do you all remember that from the seven daily disciplines? Yes. And when you have the agreement of the Word and the Spirit, all of a sudden now you have vision. You have understanding. You have that ability to discern exactly what the will and the heart of God is. See, something was awakened within Phinehas. I am sure because he was part of that priestly line that he was studying the Torah. He was meditating on the Word of God. That Word was saturated within him. And it took that Word, and at that moment, the Spirit of God being in agreement within him that awakened the zeal for the Lord with, that would eventually relate to the perpetual priesthood. See, having the Word within you it's not just good enough. Being moved by the Spirit and spiritual is not good enough. It is ne as a necessity to have the agreement of the Word and the Spirit within you. When you have that, you have God's character at work within you. The first thing that happened with Phinehas was that he was awakened. That's number one. The very first thing, the first step of this entire process for us to elevate our priesthood, to elevate our zeal for the Lord, is that we are awakened. Guys, can I tell you that I was awakened this morning during worship? Like, to an even greater degree than I was already thinking that I was spiritually awake. Anybody else get more awake in the presence of God, especially as his word began to flow, as his word began to come out to us, something inside of me began to come alive, began to come awake with confidence. I can tell you guys that the Lord is awakening us this morning. He's making sure that we don't miss that first and most essential part of the process is that we are awakened to what he is zealous for. That we are alive, we realize what our God is after. Let's put Isaiah 42, 13. You guys stay in Numbers 25. We're going to read Isaiah 42, 13. It says, the Lord will march out like a champion or like a warrior. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. Man, you can't go through our worship set that we did this morning and not come away with that kind of concept. Awaken to the fact that our God is a champion and a warrior and He must stir up His own zeal. Our God has zeal, but He must stir it up. 
We're his soldiers. We're his men. We're inscripted into his service. We volunteer to be his warriors, his agent of change on the earth. So what he is doing with us this morning is he's saying, hey, if I'm stirring up my zeal, I'm telling my soldier, my warrior, to stir up his zeal as well. I'm saying, awaken. Awaken yourself. Awaken yourself to my desires. Awaken yourself to what you hear my spirit saying and what my word is so clearly defining for you in your life. Awaken this morning. Because elevating your zeal for the Lord elevates your priesthood. Did y'all hear that clearly? Nick, say it one more time so we can get it. Elevating your zeal for the Lord elevates your priesthood. I want us to look at something real quick. In this same verse of Isaiah 42, verse 13, pull it up in the NASB. It has something that I just haven't gotten my mind off of. Let's see. There we go. Oh, this is perfect. The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of what? Like a man of war. Here's where it's coming. He will utter a shout. Yes! He will raise a war cry. Who's going to raise a war cry? Who's going to elevate their zeal so they can elevate their priesthood? In doing so, you, along with the Lord, will prevail against your enemies. But let's talk some more about awakening to our zeal. Uh, Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Stay where you're at in Numbers, because we're going to come back to it. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, in the NIV. But if I say, I will not mention him, or speak any more in his name. Let's pause real quick. Jeremiah is a man. He's a man just like you and me. He has a relationship with the living God. And the Lord is asking him to do something more than what he is currently capable of doing. To be a prophet to the nation of Israel during the time and height of their rebellion prior to captivity. And the Lord is telling him to utter his words and confront their condition. He wanted him to care enough to confront. And Jeremiah is saying, but if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, doesn't that sound a lot like why even try? Doesn't that sound like despair of I'm just not strong enough to do God's will for my life? Lord, I know you told me to do this, but I'm not good at it. Yes, he is fully aware of that. That is not taking him by surprise. But Lord, I tried for two weeks and it's not working. He is fully aware of that too. Just so happens that he is eternal. He can take as much time as he needs to develop this in you. His word is in my heart like a fire. What souls are insecurities? It's having his spirit and his word in agreement inside our heart so much that it's a fire shut up inside of our bones. It should irritate you. It should make you weary of holding it in, just like the scripture says. When the word and the spirit are in agreement in you, you cannot sit still. You've got to do something about it. Because this passage start with, but if I say, I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name. God knows how to cure your problem of insecurity. Because he's going to give you his spirit and his word. They're going to agree and they're going to ignite his passion and zeal within you. He wants you to elevate your zeal because he wants you to elevate your priesthood. There is no other option. Verse 11 of Jeremiah 20 says, But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. We read earlier in Isaiah 42 that the Lord is a warrior. He's a man of war. And like a warrior, he stirs up his zeal. Now we're at the point when Jeremiah is insecure, when he feels like he cannot even fulfill God's call on his life 
The fire of God's word and his spirit is elevating his zeal. And he is becoming a warrior just like God is. He's elevating his zeal to God warrior status. That's what we are trying to cultivate inside this church tonight or today. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Well, it's one thing to make a snafu in front of a few friends, right? Guys walk in, you don't realize that your fly is down after you came in from the bathroom. That's kind of humiliating. That's disgraceful. <laughs> Making up words that do not exist in the dictionary as you're preaching. <laughs> Forever recorded on YouTube and our sermon app. That's, that's disgraceful. It's humiliating and it's cleansing my heart. But when you are elevating your zeal and elevating your priesthood, you become a warrior just like God and obtain warrior-like status. Then everything that opposes you is thereby opposing God and it is thoroughly disgraced. It's broadcasted in the heavenly realms, which has greater coverage than any satellite station or news company. Jeremiah was lacking in zeal, but it was awakened by the word and the spirit being in agreement inside of his heart, inside of his soul. Jeremiah, elevating his zeal for the Lord, was thereby elevating his priesthood in the Lord. In Acts 4.31, we just had an example of a man of God elevating his zeal for the Lord. In Acts 4.31, we have an example of a first century church in Jerusalem after some serious, serious conflict. See, there was conflict, there was abrasion in their lives. And after that conflict, they came back. And Acts 4.31 tells us what they did. It says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. See, conflict gave them confidence that they were in the kingdom. Amen. It's a new word, brother. It's about 15 minutes old. Conflict gave them confidence that they were in the kingdom. So what did they do in the face of that conflict? Well, in the face of that conflict, they continued in the battle, in the fight, as warriors of God. They came back to their place of unity. They got together. They got full of the Spirit of God. They got full of the Word of God. Yeah. And as one unit, they went out with the zeal of God and preached yeah. the Word of God boldly. Yeah. This is incredible because we're not just calling one or two or ten or even twenty families to the zeal of God today. You see, as a unit, we're called to elevate our priesthood. Amen. It's not just one Finihas in the room or five Finihases in the room today. As a church, as LCM, as a unified group of families, we are all called together to elevate our priesthood, Amen. which means the way that we get there is that we elevate our zeal together as well. We elevate God's standard in our life as well. We elevate our level of the word and the spirit acting together in our lives as well. Elevating their zeal for the Lord elevated their priesthood. Come on. In that passage of Acts 4, they were filled with the spirit and spoke the word of God more boldly. Spoke the word of God boldly. I want to read something to you real quick out of Isaiah 50, verse 4, is where it will start. You can pull it up on the screen. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning. Wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. In this awakening process, 
You got to pay attention when the Lord is beginning to stir you. Literally what it may mean is that you're waking up at 5.30 and 6 o'clock without an alarm. For some of you, that is a miracle in and of itself. And when the Lord is stirring you without an alarm in your ear, but an alarm in your soul, respond to it. Elevate your zeal so you can get up, read the word, have the spirit agree with that word inside of you. And the rest of the day, you're then elevating your priesthood. I can say that because that's exactly what the Lord has been doing to me. I thought it was blood sugar. I thought it was deep concern for the cares and worries of this church. And it may have been both. But what was greater is that the Lord was wakening my ear. He was stirring me morning by morning saying, Matt, get up. I want you to seek my face. Get up. I want you to get into my word because the level and capacity that I have for you in my will, you have got to match by elevating your zeal to accomplish it. I cannot sit back and complain and blame anybody else for an insecurity or insufficiency inside of myself. But what I can do is elevate my zeal. What I can do is seek the face of God more earlier in the morning. Getting his word and his spirit in agreement. When Phinehas was awakened, elevated his zeal thereby elevating his priesthood, the next thing that happened is that Phinehas left the assembly. Do you all remember reading that in Numbers 25? It should be still open to it. And he left the assembly of those who were weeping. He stepped away from them. See, there's a progression whenever we have our eyes open to see what God sees. That agreement of the word and spirit in us is awakening a zeal. Now we're doing something about it. Now our feet actually have to start walking. Because what we are walking towards is where the Lord stands. And thereby what we're walking away from is where everyone else stands. See, that's what Phinehas saw when his eyes were open. He saw the difference between where the Lord stood and where everyone else stood. And he says, I'm going over there. I'm standing exactly where the Lord is. Well, what that looks like in our lives is that we're walking away from the conformity to the pattern of this world. Now, that, that's from one of my favorite scriptures in Romans 12. I love it. But we have to make sure we till up the soils of our heart with this and not just become a quaint passage that we are familiar with but have no idea how it applies. What I mean is, the conformity with the pattern of this world is giving in to what normal life looks like. Normal life within the United States. The American dream, right? Oh, wow. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of idolatry. <laughs> Even maybe the Texas dream. Having a ranch, having some cattle, some llamas, a couple of four-wheelers, horses. Big trucks, fast cars. But the Texas dream is not God's dream. The zeal to be anything other than like the character of God is idolatrous. And there's a response that we must have from it. What do you need to begin to walk away from? That the Lord is opening your eyes to see a distinction between Him and everybody else. Because our way of life is not normal to America. Our way of life is not normal to Texas. Our way of life is not normal to the Christian world as we know it. They call us a cult. They say we're crazy. We're fanatical. And we produce more fruit for God than anybody else. And that comes from walking away from the normalcy of how husbands and wives get along. Meaning that we are establishing shalom in our homes by operating in the right order of our homes. Husbands, 
We've been saying for years in the culture that we have is stand up, be men, and lead your home. Wives, make yourself radiant and beautiful by rightly easering your husband, following him wholeheartedly, being fully supportive of his vision. Amen, Susanna. Yes, it's a good word. Get in the truck with your husband and take your family with you. How we parent, how we parent is outside the normalcy of our culture. I have had the pleasure of watching Nick Aragina, Judah, and Peyton rear their children. Literally, rear their children. No shame for them, no shame for their children. The diaper comes down and commencing the discipline on the buttocks. This is the standard of the word. Thereby, it's a standard for LCM. I know it produces good fruit because I'm watching it in all of our children as we put it into practice. But you do not have the opportunity nor ability to deviate from what the word says. Many of you, I, I've been with you when you're disciplining your children and it is lacking zeal. You're not elevating your zeal in rearing your children it's a light tap you may i think you hurt the diaper more than you hurt them i can see the child's face when you can't they're they're smirking and they're only 18 months old then they turn and look towards you and give a fake cry to let you know that you've done your job and that everything is good now they run off and go do the same thing that you just spanked them for wow Exactly. You got to elevate your zeal in your parenting. Elevate your zeal so you can elevate their priesthood as well as yours. For you singles out there, you need to elevate your zeal. Your zeal for the Lord. Elevating your zeal for the Lord will resolve that zeal that you have to just not be lonely. Elevating your zeal for the Lord will elevate your ability to rejoice for other people's weddings more than you even would for yourself. It removes that despair of why even try. And it makes you radiant, beautiful, handsome. Yes, that. <laughs> Lastly, discipleship. Elevate your zeal in discipleship. This isn't just about head knowledge. This is about life application. Taking this way of life that you've seen inside of us that is abnormal to this world and perfectly normal to Scripture. And with an elevated zeal, elevating your priesthood by walking through the Talmudine process. See, when we are awakened, we begin to walk. Just like Phinehas did, walking away from those who are separate from where God is standing. The assembly of the weeping is a very dangerous place. It's a dangerous cycle to get into. And it looks something like this. Um, you're holding something that you desire. And the testimony of the word and the spirit comes to you and shakes you up. And the Lord desires to put his zeal in you and to equip you to destroy what you're holding and to start holding other things, weapons of war. Yeah. And compromise happens. And you do not follow through with this process. And you continue to hold what God said not to hold. And so you find yourself weeping at an altar somewhere. And you're in a process because you feel convicted. You know what the Word says. You know what the Spirit says. And so you're weeping at an altar. And you get up and then nothing changes. And you get in this vicious cycle. It's just a vicious, nasty cycle of, of the Lord's zeal trying to to come through your life and there's glimpses of it and there's flashes of it and you get a taste of it every once in a while but because there is no follow through the weeping has to suffice for your action the lord's calling us today to get elevated as a unit 
That weeping is no longer going to suffice for our action. You see, number three is that Phinehas took a spear in his hand. Phinehas dropped his place in the assembly of the weeping. And he said, I'm not going to do this anymore. This is not my position. I'm dropping this and I'm going to get real weapons of warfare. (laughs) And he picked up the word. And he picked up the spirit in this spear and he went and he went out to do something to finish the work he went out to change something he got the zeal of the lord he left the assembly of the weeping and he took actions with these weapons of war we are called to get the authority of these weapons in our right and in our left hands but it does not happen if we remain in the assembly of the weeping The call this morning is do not weep. Do not weep. Get up and start walking. Get up and and pick up your equipment. Pick up your weapons of war and go do what God is telling you to do. Go do what the zeal of the Lord is commanding for you to accomplish. It's time to get in the battle, not just be on the sidelines and watch it happen and feel satisfied. Who's ready to jump in with me? Come on. What that leads to is our fourth item. That Phinehas followed the Israelite. So he just took a spear in his hand. He is full of zeal for the name of the Lord. What do you think that walk looked like? Was it just a stroll? Like, okay, I'll I'll get to it. Determined. Confident. I could imagine it's very similar to whenever I see one of my children directly disobeying me. I get up, I walk, I grab that paddle off of the wall, and there's a change in my gait. It's on! I'm full of zeal. I'm going to rectify this situation on their rear end. It's that same purposeful gait that Phinehas had when he was going after Zimri. See, when you stop weeping and you start walking then your zeal becomes even more real zeal not in action is not real zeal it should move you to do something about it just going and getting a word to confront a situation inside of you your dependents or your disciples and then sitting on it not giving it waiting for the perfect moment that's not zeal that's just a good word But a good word in action will produce righteous fruit in other people and in you when the zeal of the Lord causes you to get up and start walking. You got to walk towards the Zimri, towards that Israelite inside of you. That means you have your stones in your pocket, you have your word next to you, and the minute that Zimri pops up inside of you and wants to oppose God's will and character inside of you, you got to get up, grab that word, and walk with intention to put it down. You take out that scripture, that card, you put it right in front of your face, and you run it through the heart of Zimri inside of you. For your dependents, husbands, that's your wife, your wife and your children. Wives, that's your household, your children. You got to do the same thing inside of their heart that you're doing inside of yours. But what sometimes happens is that we begin to excuse what's happening inside of our our spouse, what's happening inside of our children, because we want to be excused of our behavior. We haven't put Zimri to death inside of us. Husbands, our families are a reflection of who we are. And if they're lacking zeal to put to death Zimri, then guess who is? Us. It starts at the top. I know Jesus doesn't lack zeal. I know the Father doesn't lack zeal. And if my family is lacking zeal, that means I am. And I know it because when the Spirit and the Word come alive inside of me in agreement, all of a sudden I have that clarity. And then I have that right walk to go after what is in opposition. We have to stop weeping. We have to start walking in order to elevate our zeal for the Lord and thereby elevating our priesthood. Number five, the last step in the process 
is oh so important. Phinehas drove the spear through sin. Phinehas drove the spear through sin. So picture this. Picture this for me. Put yourself in these shoes. You can be awakened to sin. You can have your eyes open to it. You can have your eyes open to the Zimri, not that is going to pop up, but that is already in you. The Zimri that is already present right now, right here, right now, this morning. You can experience God's holiness. You can know what the Word and what the Spirit are saying. You can know the direction you are to march to address the sin. You can have those weapons in your hand as you go and approach it. But imagine if Phinehas came to the entrance of that tent and he plopped his spear down and he said, Hey, this isn't good, guys. Shouldn't we, uh, shouldn't we do something different with this? Why are you doing that? Hey, stop. Stop it. Stop doing that. That's not good. I'm going to follow up with you next week, and I hope that your behavior has changed. The zeal of God and what it produces and its result is getting very clear to us. You see, when it's actually God's zeal walking through this process that is from the heavens, it produces death to Zimri. It produces a complete obliteration of the sin. It completes it. It leads to complete and total destruction of the Zimri inside you, and it does not return. You drive that spear. You complete the task. This is follow-through to complete obedience, not partial, because we're not after a partial priesthood. We're after a perpetual priesthood, and the only way to get a perpetual priesthood is through complete obedience. Amen. To help make this complete inside your mind and your heart, let's pull up that slide with the five things that we covered. Zeal for the Lord, as we've seen in Phineas' life, is that there is an awakening by what he saw. He then began to act on it. He left the weeping of the assembly, took a spear in his hand, followed the Israelite, and drove the spear through him. These are five steps for God's grace. Five is the number of grace in the word. To be in full effect in your life. This is grace. Yeah. The agreement of his word and his spirit awakens you. It opens your eyes to see. Calls you into his holiness. Gives you weapons of righteousness in your right and left hands. It sets you on your course and gives you the power to completely destroy the wickedness. That's inside of you and inside of others. But this wasn't the ultimate goal of just driving a spear through the heart of it. The ultimate goal is found at the very end of verse 9 in Numbers 25. Then the plague against the Israelites was stopped. When you take action with the agreement of the Word and the Spirit in you. You bring salvation. You bring salvation to other people. So let's start with you. When you take the Word of God and you drive it through the heart of your sinful nature, it's not only bringing salvation to you, but it's bringing salvation to everybody who interacts with you. You're now right with God. You're now not convoluted with the lies of your own sinful nature. You can actually share the Word of God. And it produces transformation inside of other people. Well, let's talk about parenting again. When you begin to drive the Word of God through the heart of your children, putting to death their sinful nature, that's not salvation not only for you and your wife, that's salvation for our whole church. That begins to make our job a lot easier. And we're not having to pick up the pieces 15 to 16 years from now. And it affects the generations. Elevating your zeal of the Lord elevates your priesthood. And what we saw in that five-faceted step of Phinehas is that we saw him elevating his zeal and elevating his priesthood to bring salvation to his entire nation to stop the weeping 
and start walking. Amen. So now that we've laid this foundation in Numbers 25, we're going to start zooming through some scriptures, opening up, awakening our eyes once more to what God has for us this morning. Our next one is 2 Kings chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 12. Say there when you're there. Oh yeah. Jehu then set out. He went towards Samaria. At Beth Eked of the shepherds, he met some relatives of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and asked, Who are you? They said, We are relatives of Ahaziah, and we have come down to greet the families of the king and of the queen mother. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Nope. Take them alive, he ordered. So they took them alive and slaughtered them by the well of Beth Eked. 42 men. He left no survivor. Whoa. He left no survivor. Doesn't this lend to what we just talked about with Phinehas? You see, we just talked, started this morning about awakening your zeal for the Lord, about having your eyes opened. Once your zeal is awakened, it's now time to annihilate. Oh, annihilation. That's not just kicking over a few walls and burning a couple of houses. That's complete destruction. Verse 15, after he left there, he came upon Jehonadab, son of Rechab, who was on his way to meet him. Jehu greeted him and said, are you in accord with me as I am with you? He's extending his right order with God to this man. It's the equivalent of saying shalom peace. I am, Jehonadab answered. If so, said Jehu, give me your hand. So extending that hand is an extension of his right order with God. Now it's up to Jehonadab to respond to that right order. Doesn't that sound like Luke 10 when you enter a village? And if you receive your peace, let your peace rest on that house. And what begins to happen to that house? Right order with God and right order with men. The gospel and ministry can flow from it. The same is with your house. Is that whenever someone in their zeal extends their right hand, a pastor, an elder, and says, are you in shalom? And you respond by receiving that right order that they have with God. Now ministry can begin to flow out of your home. But you have to be in shalom first. Give me your hand. So he did, and Jehu helped him up into the chariot. Man, that is discipleship. That you have a discipler reaching down, opening up his hand, opening up his life, opening up his shalom and saying, join me in this. Come be attached to my zeal. Model, implement, imitate my zeal, magnify my zeal. Yes. Yes. When awakened to the zeal of the Lord and annihilating what is in opposition to the Lord, you are then able to inspire others to do the exact same thing. So verse 16 says, Jehu said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. What this is, is action. It's not just words. It is action. What is your zeal for the Lord producing inside of you? Is it action? Is it taking steps of obedience to go and confront what is in opposition to God, just like Jehu, to drive like a madman to get there? I don't care what it takes. I don't care what's in my way. That's my goal. That's what I'm going to get. Nothing's going to stop me. Shalom in my home, it's going to happen. Yeah. Shalom in my children, it's going to happen. Yes. A righteous generation flowing from this church, it's going to happen in the name of Jesus. Come. Come with me. Come see my zeal. When we invite people to come to this church, that's exactly what we're saying. Come with me. I'm going to show you my zeal and their zeal for the Lord. I hope it transforms you just like it transformed me. By confronting Jehonadab and extending his right order to him, Jehu is walking towards the Zimri that's in Jehonadab's life. 
He's walking through that fear, that cowardice that has bowed down to its knee to Jezebel. And it's saying, turn, fall in, and follow me in my zeal. When Jehu came to Samaria, he killed all. He annihilated all who were left there with Ahab's family. He destroyed them according to the word the Lord has spoken to Elijah. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, look at this. We have a man of God who has stirred up his zeal like a warrior, as a warrior, just as much as God is. And it came from a word that was spoken by Elijah, and the Spirit of God was in agreement with it. It not only was settled within the prophet's soul, it got down into Jehu's soul. And look at the action and the fruit that was born from it. We fulfill the agreement of the word and the spirit whenever we begin to act on what that agreement is. Jehu has an interesting element to him, though. Because of that zeal that we just read about, God promised, my favor will be upon you up to the fourth generation. Fourth generation. I mean, we're looking in this room. We got Baj. We got Nick. We got Ezra. And then roughly around 18 years from now, there'll be another one, a fourth generation. A fourth generation of righteous men that are filled with the zeal of the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful accomplishment? But you know what's even better? A perpetual priesthood. One that doesn't end. That when we search, hunt down, put the spear to all the Zimri's in our lives and our dependents' lives, we are guaranteeing that this is going to be a perpetual priesthood. And man, we're going for that perpetual priesthood. But before we get there, we've got to go from four generations to 15. So turn to Nehemiah chapter 8 with us. Just one step along the journey to perpetual this morning. In Nehemiah 8, 9, it says, Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, 15 generations from Phinehas. And the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. You think that the people were in a vicious cycle of weeping? Yes. Do you think they needed somebody to tell them, Hey, do not mourn. Do not weep. This day is is precious to God. This day is holy. It's consecrated to God. Because this day, you're going to go from weeping to action. Come on. This day you're going to get up from the altar and you're going to go do what the zeal of God is showing you to do. But has anybody in here ever had a good cry? (laughs) I've had a good cry before. I got up from that cry and I felt really, really good, but nothing changed. Whoa. Nothing changed after the good, tr- uh, after the good cry. It made my flesh feel really good, but there was no action after it. See, the words of the law caused the people to react with weeping. But the Spirit of God coupled with them caused them to go and to do something altogether different with their lives. We are annihilating the mourning and weeping over our sin today. Look at what they do next. Verse 10, Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. Hmm. And send some to those who have nothing to share. This day is sacred to our God. Do not grieve. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Lord was telling them the same thing that we read in Numbers 25. Stop weeping and start walking. They were awakened by the agreement between the word and the spirit of God. They stopped weeping and started walking in the strength that God was trying to give them. Annihilating their past practices and sins. How many times have you just had a good cry that re- led to a deep level of despair? So many times. You begin to focus more on your failure than God is at the moment. He's trying to resurrect your zeal. He's trying to lift up your head and say, you're not acting like a son, but that doesn't remove you from being my son. Act like a son. Pick up your head. Move your feet and demonstrate my character that I put inside of you. 
When we begin to do that, we're annihilating despair. We're annihilating depression. Right? And we got to get rid of and uh, annihilate the coping mechanisms that keep us in that despair and that depression. Even if it's ice cream. Even if it's a, a constant vacation. That will never solve. That will never annihilate what is standing in the way of you elevating your zeal. But this leads to something. In this passage, we see that they set their sights and actually went on to accomplish, accomplish the Lord's directives. They were awakened, they annihilated, and now they go on to accomplish. They would have missed it if they were not awakened by the Spirit and the Word in agreement inside of them. They would have missed the accomplishment if they were not annihilating their weeping, their grieving, their mourning, and overcoming it by forcefully walking in joy. Because it, the name of this is that it's the joy of who? The Lord. The Lord. So that means He has it first. Before I have it. That means that I have to start in faith. Moving one foot in front of the other. With his joy before I ever feel joy. Many of you guys are more feelers than you are thinkers. And you wait to feel something before you start to do something. But it's got to be the other way around. You have to trust exactly what God's word says. And when you begin to put a smile on your face, thankfulness coming out of your mouth, the joy of the Lord will follow the obedience of you annihilating grief and depression. You guys ready to go from 15 generations to perpetual? Let's go together to Revelation chapter 5. You know, I love our elders. <laughs> I love the elders of this church. Amen. It's because they're not feelers. They're doers. Amen. Their action is not based on what they feel. It's based on what the word says and based on what the spirit is doing right then. Yeah. And that's why they're elders. That's why there are examples. Revelation 5.5 5, then one of the elders said to me, man, that is a good experience. <laughs> Do not weep. Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Wow. Elevating the zeal of the Lord in our lives produces this overcoming kind of joy yes. and overcoming kind of victory in Jesus. The same spirit that raised him from the dead is actually already present in you and me. But it takes walking through, having our eyes awakened to the zeal. It takes annihilating what is preventing us from yeah. moving forward. And it takes actually going and driving that spear, accomplishing what needs to be accomplished in our lives with finality. It takes those steps. Do not grieve this morning. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Look how it picks up in verse 9. You see that triumphant victory taking place. And they sang a new song. How do you know when the joy of the Lord begins to fill you? Because a new song is coming out of your mouth. It's not the same old sad country song that was coming out. Yes, I said that on purpose. I'm talking about a new song that begins to declare how victorious God already is in your situation. It begins with you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. What is this speaking to? It meant that there was no one able to unlock the mystery of salvation for the entire world. That no one could access the revelation of how all this was going to conclude. But the joy of the Lord began to fill. Fill them as the elders spoke to him the directive. And everyone around the throne began to sing this song. That there is one who's worthy to give us revelation. He's able to open its seals. And it says exactly why. Because you were slain, Lamb of God. 
And with your blood, you purchased men for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, you made them to be a kingdom and what? Priest. Priest. Jesus possessed an elevated level of zeal that matched his father's. Thereby it elevated his priesthood so that he could elevate us to participate in that perpetual priesthood. That zeal enabled him to endure the cross as a joy set before him. A joy. If you're lacking joy when having to sacrifice, you need to elevate your zeal. It'll cure it. It'll cure it in an instant. And you'll begin to act in the same manner as a priest as Jesus did. See, Jesus here is accomplishing the perpetual priesthood. Accomplishing a perpetual priesthood that states it will last forever. But what is our responsibility right now? You should be hearing our words and beginning to prepare your heart, cultivating it. Saying, what must I do to elevate my zeal for the Lord so that I can elevate my priesthood? What has to be removed? What has to have the sword or the spear of God's word go through the heart of Zimri in my life so I can elevate my zeal and thereby elevate my priesthood? Because I can tell you this, Jesus will have his victory. Jesus will bestow that perpetual priesthood upon those who continue to elevate their zeal, elevating their priesthood. It's going to happen with him. Whether or not you are with him is up to you. What are you going to do? You cultivate your heart. Drive a spear through the Zimri. Let's go back to Numbers 25. to focus in on verses 10 through 13 as we're heading toward a close in this message. The Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites. Can you feel the sigh of relief? Yes. For he was as zealous as I am for my honor among them, so that in my zeal I did not put an end to them. The Lord gives us the reason why the plague stopped. He gives us the reason why Phinehas did any of what he did. The whole reason is that the Lord's honor trumped all. God's honor in Phinehas' life and in everything that he was in charge of and put in the situation of, God's honor trumped everything else. It was a zeal, but it was specifically a zeal for the honor of the name of God that caused him to do everything that he did. Is zeal for the Lord's honor stirring you up? Like it stirs the Lord up. Is it stirring you up like it stirs Phinehas up? Is it burning in you? God's honor is burning in you like it was burning in Jeremiah's bones. Is zeal for the Lord's honor shaking you to your core? Like it was shaking the church in Jerusalem. Is it shaking you now? This zeal for the Lord's honor must be awakened in us today. Do you want Him honored, church? Do you want God glorified? There's a promise that goes with that, starting in verse 12. Therefore tell Him, I am making my covenant of peace with Him. He and His descendants will have a covenant of a lasting, a perpetual priesthood. Because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. This morning we have an opportunity to elevate our zeal for the Lord so we can elevate our priesthood to the same level. Our a priesthood, one that is making atonement for the nation of Israel. Wow. That's the plain understanding. 
that your elevation of zeal, your elevation of priesthood can directly affect the nation of Israel. We need to possess a priesthood that is making atonement for the nations. A priesthood that is making atonement for our church families. A priesthood that is making atonement for our dependents and our disciples. A priesthood that is establishing a covenant of peace and inviting others to join in it. But there's something that we have to clearly identify. And that is rightly determining what kind of sorrow we have. And there's two types that we want to go over with you in the, in the Word. So let's turn to our last scripture together, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we will start in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we will start in verse 10. All right, last scripture. Everybody get there. Mighty God, would you stir up? Our zeal in this place yes, for your honor, for your glory. Would we be wrapped up? Would we have our gaze set Amen. on the honor of your name, of the glory of your name above everything else? Lord, help us to let go and grab a hold of those spiritual weapons of warfare today. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Come on. <laughs> Yes. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness. Yeah. What eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation. What alarm. What longing. What concern. What readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. <laughs> All worldly sorrow leads to death. Your weeping and despair leads to death. Your inactivity to respond to the agreement of the Word and the Spirit leads to death. But godly sorrow, godly sorrow brings repentance. You know what godly sorrow really is? It's the agreement of the Word and the Spirit occurring within you. How many times prior to being born again and after have you read a scripture over and over and over and you're still bowing down to that Zimri that hasn't been put to death yet? And all of a sudden the Spirit of God is able to go through the callousness of your mind and heart and hit that word. And it comes alive. There's a zeal. A zeal that responds with godly sorrow. You know how I knew I was lost? Before that moment of being born again is the way that I prayed every night, Nick. When I was lost, I prayed like this. Lord, don't kill me for this. Forgive me for that. Pray that I don't die and that other person die because we did that last week. I was under a constant source of judgment and condemnation. The day I got born again, the day that the Spirit and the Word agreed within my soul, I fell head over heels in love with Jesus. It brought repentance. It led to salvation. And you know what the best part was? No regret. No guilt. No shame. Nothing hanging off of my back condemning me, saying I'll never be a son of God. But everything in me was saying, you are a son of God. And I've given you my zeal to live up to it. I didn't hear those words weeping or mourning as we read through the list of what godly sorrow produces in our life. It's a really interesting revelation. It is because it puts the emphasis on the right action. Yeah. puts the emphasis on what it actually does produce in you. It does produce the following things. Earnestness. Oh, godly sorrow at work in you produces an earnestness to get things right to get things yeah. back in shalom in yeah. earnestness to just get it done there's nothing else that's more important than what god is showing you the next one is eagerness man there is a zealous pursuit of getting it right no apathy no dragging your feet but i'm talking about getting up and running towards zimri wow 
The next one is indignation. You see, what really does happen is godly sorrow produces a hatred for what you just found. Oh my goodness, I'm going to drive the spear through this thing right here because I hate it. It stands in opposition to God. Instead of just crying and weeping about this thing, I'm doing something about it. I know that God hates it. I have His zeal at work inside of me, and I am moving toward it actively. The next thing that godly sorrow produces are alarms. Alarms start going off in you. I'm talking about that godly sorrow that produces that heightened awareness about something that's rising up inside of you that is in opposition to God. Wow, that just came in my mind. Wow, that just came out of my mouth. Wow, look at that action I just did before I was blind to it. Now there's an alarm going off. I got to deal with this. Wow, my child just walked across the room with those half moon eyes. I got to get up and do something about this. My disciple is struggling with this area. I got to get up. I have to hear the alarm that comes from godly sorrow, that agreement of the word and the spirit. Get up and do something about this. Can your zeal... Can you see your zeal being formed by these adjectives found in the word this morning? This is what a zeal stirring up looks like. The next one is longing. You cannot have a longing for something and be dwelling in despair simultaneously. Godly sorrow kills, destroys despair, and produces a longing for righteousness. A longing, something that you must have and that you do not give up on before you see it. All this last one, concern. Cody, I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about my finances. I'm concerned about my health, Nick. You know what the Greek word for this word concern is? Zelos. It is zeal. Oh, that's so much better than concern. See, when you become awakened of your zeal, by the spirit and word and agreement inside of you, you begin to fulfill the fruits of godly sorrow. For those of you making disciples, how do you know if it's worldly sorrow or godly sorrow? Look right here in this verse. Do you see these elements being displayed in their life or not? Husbands, measure this with your families. Wives, measure this with your children. And what we're aiming for, what we're driving the spear into, is that we want to see godly sorrow inside of this church. No more worldly sorrow. As the Lord continues, as we speak, as we move forward, as we conclude this message and move forward, as the Lord is speaking and stirring up this zeal, it leads to our next step of annihilation. And that is next on our list. It says, a readiness to see justice done. You are ready to annihilate anything that stands between you and the will of God. You're ready to annihilate anything that stands between you and the character of God. Anything that's in the way, it's going down. You are taking it down with weapons of righteousness, the spirit that he's filled you with, the word that is on your heart and on your mind and flowing out of you, the power of that he's put in you, the resurrection power that Jesus has displayed and will display at the fulfillment of the perpetual priesthood is being equipped and being stirred inside of you this morning. Where that lands and concludes in 2 Corinthians 7 is proving yourselves to be innocent. There's an accomplishment in this. We had an awakening within this list. Nick just mentioned an annihilation within this list and where it's landing is on accomplishment proving yourself to be innocent innocent of what innocent of being led by fear proving yourself innocent of giving in to carnal compulsions innocent of being apathetic and not taking the right action that you know you should have taken ultimately innocent of Weeping when you should have been walking. Our hearts long to be proven innocent. But without the blood of Jesus that is speaking to the agreement of the word and the spirit, we cannot elevate our zeal that will result in godly sorrow and proving us innocent. 
It's only by that agreement of the word and spirit. Empowered by the blood of our king. Can we begin to experience the fruit of godly sorrow? We're bringing this message to an end, church. You can stand to your feet. So it's time for us to get our marching orders this morning before we go out there. It's time for us as warriors of God to understand where he is standing right now and what he is zealous for right now. I love the faithfulness of our God. Because if we ask, we ask for his character, we ask for his zeal, we ask for him to stir us, and he will. It's his desire that we represent him well. It's his desire that his church on the earth is formed, placed like one stone upon another in his image, in his likeness. It's his desire that we are zealous for the things that he is zealous about. So here's how we want you guys to respond. The time at the altar will be a time of asking the Lord to show you the agreement of the word that we just preached to you and his spirit bringing it to life inside of you. Ask the Lord to awaken. Awaken my soul. Awaken my zeal for you, Lord God. Elevate my zeal so I can elevate my priesthood. What is standing in the way? And once that's identified by the Lord to you, annihilate it. Annihilate it with that zeal. Annihilate it with that fervent love for your king. And in doing so, I want you to stand up from this altar and go out and accomplish the right order that you have been restored back to. Accomplish the will of God today, tomorrow, the next day. Accomplish the will of God in your families and your relationships. But it starts by being awakened. So mighty God, right now, we ask, I ask, Lord, do you awaken my zeal for you? Awaken my zeal for the honor of your name that I may elevate my priesthood. Lord, elevate my zeal. Elevate our zeal. Help us annihilate what stands in the way of that elevation. Help us accomplish what that zeal is after for your name. Oh, we welcome your presence. We welcome your spirit in this place. Come and fill us, mighty God. Come and agreement with your word that's inside of us. Let us be the priests that you've made us to be.